tonight I do have a word that the Lord give me to minister to you. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Psalm chapter 119, the longest chapter in the Bible. Psalm 119, uh, beginning in verse 57. Hallelujah. I have titled this this morning, this morning, I've titled this this evening, The Lord is My Portion. And uh, before I read the passage, I'm going to tell you a few things about this message. This is one of the most difficult messages that I've ever put together. And I've preached quite a few sermons now. Um, but at the same time, it's one of those messages that I am 100% confident that the Holy Spirit spoke to me about. And uh, I was at a, a meeting the other day um, with, a, with a friend of mine who is uh, doing some youth meetings right now at a minister's conference, and I wanted to go to support them. And uh, during the praise and worship, the Spirit of God fell on the place. And, and you know how sometimes you, you move beyond the music and you move beyond the songs, and you really don't give a rip who's up there or what they're singing, and you don't care what it sounds like because you have entered into the throne room of heaven. And I was in one of those moments where I crossed over, and I knew that it was a holy moment. And uh, when, I, when I visit churches, I like to sit in the back and hide out, and part of that's because I'm so used to being up front. And so I was a guest, I sat in the back, I had me a good corner, and I remember a moment where the Holy Spirit came on me so strongly. And I was praying in the Spirit, I was worshiping, I felt the power of God on me, and I heard the Holy Spirit speak this to me, the Lord is the portion of the saints. The Lord said it again, the Lord is the inheritance of of the saints. Folks, I've never heard anything like that. And so I stopped. And I said, the Lord is the portion of the saints. I began to pray into that word. And I had to go to Google and type in, the Lord is the portion. Because I didn't know if there was a verse that said that. And lo and behold, here we are. Hallelujah. Psalm 119, verse 57. But if you're taking notes tonight, my first point is just that. The Lord is the inheritance of or the portion of the saints. Psalm 119. The Lord is my portion. I promise to keep your words. I'm reading from the ESV tonight. I entreat your favor with all my heart. Be gracious to me according to your promise. When I think on my ways, I turn my feet to your testimonies. I hasten and do not delay to keep your commandments. Hallelujah. Amen. Though the cords of the wicked ensnare me, I will not forget your law. At midnight I rise to praise you because of the righteous rules. I am a companion of all who fear you and those who keep your precepts. The earth, O Lord, is full of your steadfast love. Steadfast love is a terrible translation of that word. That's a word, hesed. It's covenant faithfulness beyond the call of duty. It is... It is the, the covenant faithfulness of the Lord that never ceases. It never changes. It never wavers. It is solid as a rock. It is faithfulness that goes above and beyond anything you can ask, think, or imagine. The earth, O oh Lord, is filled with your hesed, your covenant faithfulness. Teach me your statutes or teach me your law. There's... Um, a weight that I've been carrying and I I struggled with it and I, I wrestled with it because this is camp meeting and, and, I, and I fear that in the church there is so much of the world pouring into the church and when I and when I see our believers and our Christians who sit in our pews day after day, I'm beginning to see that we think and act like the world and sprinkle Jesus and his kingdom on the top of our mess. And I can preach real hard to you tonight because you ain't got to vote on me. Hallelujah. Whew, if it gets too hard, Gospel Tabernacle people, y'all just uh, go back and listen to my first message on grace. And uh, it'll even you out on the way home. <laughs> Hallelujah. 
But my heart's broken tonight because, folks, we need a move of God. Like we are in a desperate situation. Like the watchmen on the wall should be shouting the alarm as the church. We should be alarmed at the foolishness that has swept our country. And it ought to drive us to our knees until we become a praying people. I'm telling you, there is a brokenness that has swept our land. And if you think the church is immune to it, think again. Because it has swept across our pews. And we have become comfortable with the sin that we're not willing to deal with. Hallelujah. We've become comfortable growing to be... I ain't even using these notes. Lord, hallelujah. I'm going to get to them in a minute. Y'all hold up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Too much of the church has grown comfortable in rebellion. We've relied on our tactics. We've relied on great music. We've relied on charisma and other things. And our world around us is dying because the church cannot save them. Only Christ. Only Christ. The Lord is the inheritance of the saints. And so it's with that heart I want to minister to you tonight. Psalm 119 is an acrostic poem. And so that means that each stanza of that poem begins with a different letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And so here we have the letter, uh, I got to say it, but there we are, het. I got to say it. I had to learn a song for it so I could pass my four semesters of Hebrew class. Dr. Lyons would be very proud. Um, It's an acrostic poem and this section of the poem falls somewhere about whereabouts in the middle. And he opens it with this interesting statement, right? The Lord is my portion. The word portion here is the same word that's used in Joshua 15 as, the, as Joshua and the children of Israel are settling the promised land. And Joshua is um, setting up different uh, sides of the land and uh, allotting a different section to the various tribes of Israel. And so the, the same word, could be translated, the political priests, although portion or inheritance with Israel, they shall eat the Lord's food offerings as their inheritance. They shall have no inheritance among their brothers, for the Lord is their inheritance. As he promised them, and this shall be the priests due from the people, from those offering a sacrifice, whether an ox or a sheep, they shall give to the priest the shoulder and the two cheeks and the stomach, the first fruits of your grain, of your wine and your oil, and the first fleets of your sheep you shall give him. For the Lord has chosen him out of all of your tribes to stand and minister in the name of the Lord, him and his sons for all time. I want you to think about this passage of Scripture here in Deuteronomy chapter this idea of the Lord is my inheritance, it's evident that the, psalm, the psalmist here in Psalm 119 is likely referencing this passage in Deuteronomy chapter 18. Now, it's interesting that the, the Lord considered the task of caring for the, the, the tabernacle, the task for caring for the sacrifices, and the people that he was setting apart to be a special people devoted to caring after the presence of God. It's interesting that the Lord would not allow them to have an inheritance of land. He alone is their inheritance. First Peter chapter 2, verse 9. I'm going to give you a lot of scripture so you know I'm biblical tonight. We know that there are types and shadows in the Old Testament that point to their final reality in the New Testament. We know tonight that the priest stood before God on behalf of the people and offered sacrifice. Listen to this, 1 Peter chapter 2. But you, speaking to the church, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. 
You see, in the same way that the Levitical priests of Deuteronomy chapter 18 were a people whose inheritance belonged to the Lord, a people set apart and sacred, consecrated to the things of the temple, so you, the church, the believer today, you are a people for His possession. Not your possession. And can I just take a moment and say that this... this foolishness that has swept our church where our Christianity is about God making all of your dreams come true listen your Christian walk is not about your dreams coming true you belong to him he is your dream now his purpose is your purpose I didn't follow Jesus so I could get the good life I followed him because he hung naked between heaven and earth, because he let them beat his body to a bloody pulp where Isaiah would prophesy he would be unrecognizable as a man. And he did that owing me nothing. And how could I give anything less of my life to honor the sacrifice of the bruised Lamb of God that hangs on the cross of Calvary? We are a people for His own possession. Why? That you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. Notice, He called you. You didn't find God. He found you. Hallelujah. And it was grace that brought you in. Lest any man should boast of works. Verse 10, once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. You're God's people. Once you have not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. I'm going to sit on that for a minute. You're God's people. Listen, I want to tell you tonight, you may not feel like God's people. I know sometimes we can walk into church and we can feel like everybody else is perfect and their lives are put together and they're wonderful, sanctified saints. And sometimes we can walk in and feel so unqualified so unworthy we can allow shame and condemnation in the voice of the enemy to convince us that we are not anywhere close to those wonderful great saints that we see but you're God's people and you might be broken but you're God's people and you might still struggle tonight but I want you to hear this preacher you're God's people and the moment you put faith in his cross the righteousness of Christ was put on you so when the father sees you he doesn't see you in brokenness he sees you in the wholeness which is Christ Jesus you are God's people and the sooner you start to realize it and the sooner you begin to operate in that revelation the quicker you can start to walk out this Christian life You're a royal priesthood. Revelation chapter 1, verse 5. The beginning of the book of Revelation. John the Revelator writing to them, Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before the throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of kings on earth. To him who loved us, verse 6, and has freed us from our sins by his blood. Hallelujah for the blood. And made us a kingdom and priest to his God and Father. He made you what? Who made us? Who's he talking to? He's writing to the church. He's made us a kingdom. Really, uh, many translators, I know you see the word and, but many translators have even uh, kingdom of priests. Or there, there's, there's wrestling there. But he's made us kings. He's given us royalty. He's wrapped us in the robes of righteousness, which come from Christ Jesus. And now he has called us priests unto the Lord. He goes on, verse 7. I'll read it just because it's good. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen, or let it be. Hallelujah. Now, here's what I want you to see tonight. The priests of the Old Testament stood on behalf of the people before the Lord and offered sacrifice. Now you stand before the Lord. You are called the royal priesthood. 
Now you are called a kingdom of priests unto our Lord. You now stand as a living sacrifice, Romans chapter 12, which alone is our acceptable worship. You're a priest unto the Lord called to live as a sacrifice continually offered unto him. When I say you're a priest unto the Lord, I do not mean to say that you are offering sacrifice on behalf of yourself for justification, for we know that our justification comes by faith in Christ. But the born-again believer lives the life of sacrifice, a living sacrifice unto the Lord as a priest. And if the Lord was the inheritance of the saints in the Old Testament, and if it was important for the children of Israel to take different portions of land and give them to every tribe, but to exclude one group of people, a holy group of people who were called to solely devote their, their lives to the keeping of the presence of God, and if the New Testament calls you and I a royal priesthood, and if us in Christ, who is our high priest, according to the book of Hebrews, if we are seated in Christ, if we are living as a living sacrifice before the throne of the Father, then I think that it's important for us to remember that we are called to be a people whose inheritance is the Lord. When the psalmist says that, that, this is the, that the Lord is his inheritance, this is not to say that, that the Lord is one minor part of his life that contributes to everything else. You see, the Lord was the inheritance of the priest in the Old Testament. And Christ in us, the eternal promise of glory, Colossians chapter 1, verse 27. He is our inheritance as believers in the New Testament. Here's why I wanted you to see this tonight. Somewhere along the way, we got off. Somewhere along the way, we made church about us, about my feelings. Somewhere along the way, we made it about getting our fix. Somewhere along the way, we made it about the good life. Somewhere along the way, we became infatuated with our breakthrough. And so we come to church constantly and we talk about our breakthrough. Somewhere along the way, we, we, we did exactly what Paul said that he prayed that the Corinthians wouldn't do in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. He said, I pray that the serpent wouldn't deceive you to leave the simplicity and the purity in Christ. And I fear that there is, a, there is a doctrine that is swept through the church that we follow Christ because we believe that following Christ will make our life easier. Aren't you tired of sermon after sermon, prayer line after prayer line about us? Do you ever wonder why the church has talked about revival for years and years? Aren't you tired of it? Don't come and talk to me about revival. I don't want to hear it anymore. You know how many years I grew up with 800 prophetic words that this was the year it's about to break out? And somewhere along the way, we became infatuated with crowds and revival and the miracles. And I'm not saying those things are bad. But here, look at how clever the enemy is. Take our eyes off of Jesus and put them on all of the fruit of eyes that are set on Jesus. And I believe that the church has lost her focus. Revival, healing, breakthrough will come. Those things are scriptural, and I believe that they are God's will for us. But they will come when we get to the place when we are no longer fixated on those things. I do not follow Jesus because of what He can give me. I follow Him because of who He is. Listen. Our gospel is not a means to an end. Christ is both the means and Christ is the end. But 
Philippians chapter 3. I was going to reference it, but I think I'll read it. You know, church, we're... It's not that... You know, when we read passages like we'll read here in Philippians, it's not that each of us live in the same situation as Paul, that we can all go just quit our jobs and live in some monastery and worship at the church, but it's not about that. It's about capturing the heart of Paul and then looking at my own heart and dealing with the reality that my heart does not look like his and I need to be obedient to Scripture to do as Paul says in one of his letters, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Paul says this, Philippians chapter 3, verse 4, one of my favorite passages in Scripture. If any man thinks he has reason to trust in the flesh, I have more. I was circumcised the eighth day, the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, and the Hebrews of Hebrews, as concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, and concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me I have counted these things to be lost for the sake of Christ. Certainly I count everything as loss. Did you hear that? Not I came to Christ so that I could gain everything. Not that I came to Christ so that my bank account would be filled and I could drive a brand new car and get a bigger house. Not I came to Christ so that I could socialize amongst the church people that I might grow my business in town. No, but I I suffered the loss of all things to honor the one thing, which is what? For the excellence of the knowledge of Jesus Christ, my Lord. I forfeited the loss of all things, and I count them as trash, as rubbish, that I may gain Christ. And by the way, Paul didn't do that because he thought it would justify him. Keep going and be found in Christ, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is of God on the basis of faith. So Paul didn't suffer the loss of all things because he thought it would earn him salvation. He knew that the only way we are justified is by faith in Christ. But the response to real faith in Christ How can you encounter the God of the universe who has looked at you in your brokenness and beckoned you to come unto Him and then not give everything in your life to Him? Paul goes on to know Him, the power of His resurrection, the fellowship of His suffering, being conformed to His death. When Paul is bragging to the church of Corinth, he brags of his beatings. Notice the emphasis in Philippians chapter 3 is, I suffer the loss of all things to know him. Hmm. To know him. What are you saying, preacher? The Lord is the inheritance of the saints. I'm saying here that God has called us to be a people who have determined within our hearts that Christ is enough. Christ is enough. Like, just give me Jesus. That's it. You can have the world. You can have the fame. You can have the money. Just give me Jesus. And that's not just lip service because it's a spiritual thing to say. I'm talking about God raising up a people who mean it from the very depths of who they are. That Christ is enough. That I have been to the cross and I have seen his broken body. And now I have given my life and I have determined that if he never answers another prayer, he is enough. If he never performs a miracle, he's enough. If he never does what I've asked him to do, if the church never grows, if revival the way that we think of it never comes, but I get to be in the room with him, he is enough. I've suffered the loss of all things. Why? To know, to have intimate knowledge of Jesus. Because who gives a rip what you have if you don't know Jesus? Hallelujah. Matthew chapter 13, verse 44, 46. Jesus tells a parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who finds treasure hidden in a field. 
Hallelujah. I may have given you the wrong verse, but it's a, it's a real parable. So y'all, <laughs> y'all know it. The scripture says that he found the treasure hidden in the field. You know what he did? He went and sold all that he had and he bought the field. You know what the American church wants to do? When they find the treasure in the field, they want to go visit it every now and again on Sunday morning and then go back to normal. Hallelujah. Listen, the kingdom of God is not something that you can pick up on Sunday and set back down on the way out your door. The kingdom of heaven is something that, in, that it, when it comes in, it floods every part of your life. And listen, the reason that he sold everything that he had was to buy the field full of treasure. You know, when Jesus calls at the end of John's gospel, I didn't give him the scripture, Jesus calls Peter. This has always infatuated me. Peter blew it big time, man. You know, he... He denied Jesus, whom he'd walked with for three years, denied him three times, and Jesus shows up there on the side of the lake. And not only did Peter deny Jesus, but now Peter has gone back fishing, which was the very thing that Jesus called him out of. In other words, Peter has gone all the way back to who he was before he met Jesus. Jesus is standing on the shore. You know the story. Jesus asked him three times, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Jesus answered, you know that I love you. You know how it goes. Feed my sheep. At the end of that, the Bible says this. And when he had said these things, he said unto Peter, When you were young, you girded yourself and went where you pleased. But when you are old, another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This Jesus said, signifying by what death Peter would glorify God. And then he said, follow me. He didn't say, Peter, I'm going to give you a jet and you're going to get a Mercedes and you're going to get all the money and you're going to get all the following and you're going to get all the stuff that you want and then follow me. No, no, no. He said, listen, if you go down this road, I'll tell you at the beginning where it ends. It ends with you dead on a cross, Peter. By the way, Peter was, was crucified upside down on the cross because his final request was, when you nail me to the tree, nail me upside down because I'm not worthy to hang the way that they did Jesus. I want you to know the Lord is the inheritance of the saints and He is raising up a people who are tired of the games and they're tired of the fad Christianity and they're tired of the foolishness and Christian social club on Sunday morning. A people who are ripe and ready for the move of God who have determined in their hearts, I'll sell everything to buy the field. I'll follow him if he calls me to go join Live Dead with the Assemblies of God and go to Northern Africa or the Buddhist world and be martyred. What an honor it is to be called of our Savior. You see, it's not that God doesn't want us to have healing. Don't hear me say that. That's not what I'm saying. It's not that God doesn't care about our needs. He does care. He tells us to ask Him for things. Don't hear me saying that. If I've, if I've communicated that in some way, I apologize. I'm simply here to remind us that our faith is not about what we can get. It's about the Son of God that we're called to know and to worship. And if He never does another thing for me, what He's already done is more than enough. Hallelujah. I'm going to read a few more verses to you. And I've never preached a two-point sermon. Here we go. That's all I got, so hallelujah. Lamentations chapter 3. Remember my affliction and my wonderings. Here's what I want you to see from this scripture. When you've determined in your heart that the Lord is your inheritance, when you determine in your heart that the Lord is my portion, that He's more than enough for me, that I'm satisfied, I'm content with who Christ is in my life, when you determine in your heart that Jesus is enough, then you can walk through hell and high water and find peace, find joy, and rejoice in the hope that you have in Christ. Hallelujah. Lamentations chapter 3 verse 19. Remember my affliction and my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall, my my soul continually remembers it and is bowed down within me. It's a beautiful picture of depression. 
There's a bitterness about him. There's a, my soul is bowed down within me. I'm broken. I'm hurting. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord, bad translation, the chesed, the covenant faithfulness, the faithfulness of God that is unchanging and steady, the faithfulness of God that goes above and beyond what we can ask or imagine. The steadfast faithfulness of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. How great is your faithfulness. Listen to it now. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. In other words, when hell and high water comes in my life, when the enemy comes in like a flood, I cling to Christ in me, the hope of glory. I rejoice that I may not have anything, but I have Jesus, and Jesus is more than enough. And God, help us for our faith that is so shallow and weak in the church that we serve God when it's good and we leave Him when it's not. Yeah. Some people do vice versa on that. Leave Him when it's good and come back when it's not. God, forgive us for our shallow faith that expects the Lord to cater to all of our wants. The Lord is my portion. Cornerstone, there's a call from the Lord. The ministry that's been done here the past 75 years has been tremendous. The people have been saved. The people have been healed. People have been filled with the Spirit. But God wants to do a new work here. I believe that the Holy Spirit has given me a word for you tonight for a renewed focus. A renewed heart for Christ and Christ alone. That your eyes would be ever set on the cross of Calvary, keeping the right message. The finished work of Jesus keeping the right posture, setting your mind on Christ who is the author and finisher of our faith. I believe there's an invitation of the Lord for you to be a people who say, the Lord is my portion. He's my everything. My second point. Hallelujah, it's 8.30. Hallelujah. I know that no matter how long I preach, chances are Brother Wade will preach longer on Sunday. And, uh, <laughs> my second point is not near as long. Because the Lord is our portion, because He's our everything, our lives will be lived in obedience unto Him. If you go back to Psalm 119, the Lord is my portion. It's immediately, I promise to keep your words. I entreat your favor or grace with all my heart. Be gracious to me according to your promise. When I think on my ways, so when I see myself right, I turn my feet to your testimonies. It's like I change my direction, repent. I hasten and do not delay to keep your commandments. Well, that's a word to somebody. Stop dancing around it. Stop coming up with excuses. Stop waiting on tomorrow. Today is the day of salvation. Get it right. If the Lord's dealing with your heart about disobedience in your life, get it right tonight. Don't leave out of the building still bound, still broken. Don't leave still addicted. Hallelujah. Put faith in what Christ did and believe that the cross was already enough and whatever has grabbed a hold of you can be broken in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. I hasten and do not delay to keep your commandments, though the cords of the wicked ensnare me. So while things aren't going good, look, I do not forget your law. At midnight I rise to praise you because of your righteous rules. I am a companion of those who fear you, of those who keep your precepts. The earth, O Lord, is filled with your covenant faithfulness. Teach me your statutes. Now listen, I don't have time tonight to teach you about how to walk in sanctification by faith in the finished work of Jesus. That's your pastor's job. You've heard that message. Of course, we know that we cannot fix ourselves, but only faith in Christ and His grace working in us can do that work. 
But here's what I want to do. I want to provoke you to deal with the sin you've got comfortable with. Now that you are saved, being obedient to Christ in every area of your life should be the only thing that matters. The answer should never be how something makes me feel. It should only be what does the word say? The old timers have a saying. I kind of like it. The word says it. I believe it. And that settles it. It's that easy. Listen to me. There's no such thing in Scripture as a disobedient Christian. Let me hide down here. We created that because we don't believe in the power of the cross to totally and radically transform. We wanted people to feel comfortable because they refused to have real faith which produces works in their life. How in the world could you be washed in the precious blood of the Son of God and live your life in defiance to Him? You can't. Hallelujah. And folks, that's not shame and that's not condemnation. That's a preacher with a broken heart pleading unto you, saying if your life does not show any reflection of Christ after you've been saved, then honey, you ain't been saved yet. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If he dipped you in the blood of Jesus, you are not the same. And if you are the same, then you ain't got it. Put your faith in what Christ has done. And watch the righteousness of God that is put on you by faith in his cross will produce fruit in you that will come out of you. I fear in the church we become tolerant of sin and unrighteousness in the name of false gentleness, false humility, and false love. We've allowed people to become comfortable with sin, and here's the thing, sin keeps you bound. And the reason that we preach is not because we're angry, only the immature think that. Your people haven't read their Bible. Go read the prophets. Go read the Apostle Paul where he tells them to mutilate themselves because they're teaching the people of God wrong. Boy, you think I'm mad. Hallelujah. We've allowed people to get comfortable. We've allowed them to stay bound because we're so afraid they're going to leave. I'm not picking up stones. I'm not here to throw stones. I'm here to invite you to the cross. I'm here to tell you that whoever told you that you have to stay this way because this is as good as it gets and I'm just a no good sinner saved by grace. They lied to you. You're either a sinner or you're saved. You're either the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus or you're a no good sinner. It doesn't have nothing to do with you. It has to do with Him at work in you. And we lied to you as the church. And we told people, you you get to stay bound. Some people just stay addicted. Glory to God. How's that fit? Whom the Son has set free is free indeed. Except for the ones that God's called to stay addicted. What? Free indeed doesn't mean better than it was. Free indeed means totally and completely free. Do you hear me, church? When the Lord is our portion... It produces obedience in us. And spirituality that is not producing holiness is not real. You can prophesy till you're blue in the face. You can shout in tongues, catch a jig, and run around this building. Hallelujah. But if you leave here and stay in the same sin that God's called you out of. Listen, I think we forgot. He's the Holy Spirit. Did you catch that first word? Holy. It means other. It means different. You know the scripture says in Hebrews that you are a sanctified people, that you've been sanctified. It means you've been set apart in Christ. You've been washed in His blood. Listen to 1 John chapter 3, verse 6, because some of you matter in a nest of fire ants. Is that a thing? A nest of fire ants? Oh, I can tell. Ooh, hallelujah. I, you know, some people... You get to preaching the word and you hear that gnashing of teeth. And it reminds me of when Jesus was telling the parables and it said that the Pharisees were gnashing their teeth. They're so mad at him. 
because he's preaching the truth. Hallelujah. 1 John chapter 3, in case you thought I was making it up, verse 6. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. Hallelujah. Glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Are you a branch connected to the vine by faith in Christ? If you are, no one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. The devil is a lie. Hallelujah. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. Hallelujah. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared to destroy the works of the devil, no one born of God makes a practice of sinning. For God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep sinning. Why? Because it's contrary to his new nature as one is born again. Because he has been born of God. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God. Nor is the one who does not love his brother. Listen, we need to become a people who understand the power of the blood. Nothing I am preaching to you today is suggesting to you that your justification is based on your works. Not at all. I am preaching to you that your justification will produce works. I'm preaching to you today that your new nature that comes by faith in the cross of Christ will empower you to be a holy people as he is. I'm here to encourage you that you've been given a new nature. You've been washed in the blood. You've been given a new name. That the blood of Jesus is enough for you no matter how long you've been bound to set you free in one moment. And so the psalmist says, the Lord is my portion. And the rest of the psalm talks about obedience unto him. Why? Because when Jesus becomes my everything, the only thing that matters is that I live my life submitted unto him. I'm going to end with this. Folks, his obedience is so important in the life of the believer. Number one, because we represent the Father to the world. Yeah. Worship team, y'all can head back up whenever you want to. We represent the Father of the world. L- let, me, let me, before I forget, 1 John chapter 5, do you know the answer to all this? I know I've been preaching hard, and I just don't want you to take this as some sort of works, you're going to fix yourself thing, because that's not it. And this is that which conquers the world, 1 John chapter 5, even our faith. What is that which conquers the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. You see, it's, it's faith in what Christ has done. And what's happened is the enemy has lied to us and he's kept us, he has kept us living lives that don't reflect the freedom and the fullness that Christ has already purchased for us. And obedience is important because though you may be Even when we mess up, we know that 1 John even says that, that if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. If we confess our sins, He is faithful to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. But even when God forgives us, I want you to know today that there are still consequences to sin. And we don't like to talk about it. You know, David was a tremendous man after God's own heart. He loved the Lord. He started out in the sheep pastures singing psalms to the Lord. God raised him up from being a nobody to becoming the king of Judah and then a few years later the king of all of Israel. You know the story. David David started his life with careful obedience to all of the commandments of God. He had a pure heart. But you know if you read the story of David, David had an issue with women. And it started, a long, it started a lot longer before Bathsheba. Do you know there's a commandment um, when, when God's giving instructions about the kings of Israel? Do you know there's a commandment that the kings of Israel are not to take many wives? And you know one of the first things that David did when he became king? Went and took a bunch of wives. Do you know what Solomon did, his son? You know what ruined Solomon? He went and took a bunch of wives. So, so David slowly, he, he, just, he just transgressed the commandment of the Lord a little bit. And it was all right. But a little yeast leavens the whole batch. 
And one day when he, that sin continued in David's heart, and one day he's up and he sees the woman bathing, and you know the story, and he calls her, and uh, she conceives a child, and he has her husband killed. And you know Psalm 51, Create in me, O God, a clean heart, renew in me a steadfast spirit. You know, God forgave him. You know, the, the Bible says that he cast our sin as far as the east is from the west. I believe with my whole heart that God forgave David, that in the eyes of God, that David, even though he had a moment, even though he had some sins, even though he wasn't perfect, God absolutely forgave him, that his grace was sufficient for David. But do you know David's kingdom never recovered? Every scholar you have ever read on that book will tell you that there's a shift that takes place the moment that he sleeps with Bathsheba. His kingdom falls in disarray. He starts fighting with his sons. There is battle. There is division. And the whole book goes downhill. And it ends with David's own son being killed in a battle as his son is fighting him for the throne. David's life becomes a mess, not because God was angry at David and there wasn't grace. No, but because there are real consequences to sin. And God had forgiven him, yet the consequences remained. What are you saying, preacher? Here's what I'm saying. God is raising up a people whose portion is the Lord. A people who have resigned themselves to him at everything. A people who have said within their hearts, all that I am and all that I ever hope to be belongs to Jesus. And I, because of that, because Christ is enough, now I'm going to live my life in total submission to him. I'm not going to get comfortable with the little things. But I'm going to learn to submit every thought to Christ. I'm going to learn to walk in obedience. I'm going to hold fast to the commandment of the Lord. That's the kind of people he's raising up. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you tonight. Hallelujah. God, we know that we can't walk out this Christian thing in our own faith. God, we know that, God, in our own strength, Lord, we know that it is only by our faith in Christ and His cross. I thank you that the cross is enough for us. But Lord, help us to be so careful that we don't look at your bruised body and become comfortable with the sin that we're not willing to deal with. God, let your church begin to walk in the fullness of the freedom that you purchased for us. Jesus, if your blood flowed down the cross of Calvary, then how dare we become comfortable living in less than what you died to give us? God, forgive us for every moment where we may not say it out loud, but in our hearts, we have not said that the Lord is our portion. God, we have chased other things. God, we have become so busy with the things of this world that so many, we don't even have time for you in our weeks. God, help us to step out of this world and this culture that is constantly pulling us and drawing us in a million different directions to things. Not all those things are, 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 are bad, but they're not what we're called to be. A holy nation of people set apart. And I just pray tonight, God, as our nation is in shambles, our government is messed up, God, at every level. There's corruption at every level, Lord. Our land is being swept with wickedness and perversion and demonic spirits of, of pride and sexual sin are sweeping our country and the, the world around us is celebrating it. And Father, tonight, raise up a church that won't bow the knee, a church of boldness, a church of faith, 
church who champion the cross and what he did on it. God, help us do what Paul said, to live our lives worthy of the calling of Christ wherein we were called. God, don't let us be a people who missed the time of their visitation because we were too busy. But Father, I pray tonight that you would be our portion. Give us a heart that says you can have everything else but give me Jesus. Give us a heart of surrender tonight. Jesus name church tonight he's dealing with compromise he's dealing with the sin that you've grown comfortable with and tonight he's dealing with stuff some of it's not even bad it's just not what we're called to be he's dealing with faith tonight that is so full of self that it's not even about Jesus anymore. It's about us getting what we want. And tonight, we'll open these altars up. And as we do, and as you come tonight, I encourage you to set your eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. And when you bring it to Him, you do one thing. When you bring it to the altar, you put it at the foot of His cross. And you believe that the cross is enough. And you leave it there. In Jesus' name. Worship team, if y'all will sing something tonight, we'll open these altars. Hallelujah. And are you past the point of weary? Is your burden weighing heavy? Is it all too much to carry? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Do you feel that empty feeling? Cause shame's done all it's stealing Are you desperate for some healing? Let me tell you about my Jesus
much about me let me tell you about my jesus oh he makes a way where there ain't no way rises up from an empty grave hey no sinner that he can't save let me tell you about my jesus his love is strong and his grace is weak and the good news is i know that he can do for you Folks, I wanted to end after altar with this. We talked tonight about the Lord is the inheritance of the saints, about getting our eyes off pursuing the stuff, even the good stuff, and pursuing Christ. Here's the good news. When the Lord becomes my portion, and I seek Christ and Christ alone and what He did for me on the cross, Matthew 6, but seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Yes. And all that good stuff, the healing, the breakthrough, all that other stuff. When my faith is placed in the proper place, when my pursuit is of Christ, then all these things shall be given unto you. Amen. Amen. Brother Wade. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. for just a second I want to pray over you and dismiss you but you know there's been this is the second time this week that somebody's cracked a joke on how long I preach and if you know if I was a person of a complex I would listen to them Uh, but anyhow when Luke recorded the book of Acts and he recorded the first Pentecostal message he said and with many more words Peter addressed the people and so the first Pentecost preacher preached for a long time and so this Pentecost preacher ain't shortening nothing up. The way I look at it is I've been at a lot of high school football games and I've watched people shout and cheer and jump and act all kinds of crazy ways for three or four hours to watch a team lose. We ought to be able to come to church for two hours and watch a king win every time. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Well, thank you so much for coming out tonight. I do just by way of announcement, uh, tomorrow night, 7 p.m., right here in the sanctuary, Brother Fred Calhoun will be bringing the word, and their worship team will be leading us. Praise the Lord. Saturday at 2 p.m., Pastor Josh Lee, former pastor of this church, he will minister. Our worship team will be leading at 5 p.m. in the Outreach Center. We will be having a meal and a dedication service for that facility in the memory and honor of uh, Brother Leon Morrow, who was the longest tenure pastor of First Assembly. And so uh, he is the one who's moved the church from where the car wash is now to this building and oversaw the start of that outreach center. And so uh, tomorrow at 5, that will be taking place. Uh, The menu is Uncle T's pulled pork and barbecue potato, baked potato. Say, who's Uncle T? Well, that's me. And so it's good, I promise you. It'll be the best you put in your mouth. Don't ask me, ask people who eat my cooking. And so, but then at 7 p.m. tomorrow evening, we will have our third service, huh? Saturday, Saturday, Saturday. This is Thursday. 
Saturday at 7. So Saturday at 2, Pastor Josh Lee in the sanctuary, 5 o'clock, we'll be in the outreach for a dedication. I have invited the Nazarene Church and the Methodist Church because they sowed a seed 77 years ago that has that resulted in this. And praise the Lord, 77 years later, I have a working relationship with both of those churches. And so God is still doing a good thing. And so they'll be here at 5 o'clock, 7 o'clock Saturday. Brother B.J. Smith will be preaching. Amen. Amen. Brother B.J. was presbyter for many years and oversaw many years of... You know, as any true story goes, there's a season of dark time. And so, Brother, <laughs> Brother BJ, it's just the truth. This, this church had a few years that was rough. Ain't no sense in lying about it. But God's faithful and he's seen us through. And Brother BJ, as presbyter, had to oversee some of those things. And so he will be here ministering Saturday at 7, our worship team, again, leading in worship. And then Sunday, 10.30 in the morning and 6 p.m., we will have services and I will be preaching the word during those messages and so those times. And so we would love to have you at every service that you can be, other than when your church is having church, go to your home church. Amen. But they don't have Sunday night service. So we'll see y'all Sunday at 6. And so, <laughs> no, we love you. God bless you. Let's pray. Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. And Lord... We humble ourselves before you. And we thank you, God, that you are our portion. You are more than enough. So, Lord, as we leave this place, help us to understand we may leave this building, but we do not leave your presence. And that our eyes would ever be fixed upon the cross of Calvary, understanding who you are and what you've done, and that you are our inheritance, our portion. And you have a covenantal love for us that surpasses anything this world can throw at us. And so, God, tonight, I just pray a blessing over each and every one. Lord, that their hearts be lifted up, their minds be clear, and their faith be fixed on you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. We love you. God bless you. See you tomorrow at 7. Be careful heading home. As Sister Judy Griffin would remind you, watch for dogs and hogs. Amen. Thank you so much again for taking time to listen to a message from the sanctuary of Cornerstone Assemblies of God. We do this through the help of our listeners and friends in the community. If you would like to donate to our broadcast, you can go to cornerstoneatlanta.tv and give as the Lord would lead you. But again, I, Pastor Richard Wade of Cornerstone Assemblies of God, just say thank you for taking time, and I pray the Lord make this real to you today.